The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled, The Field of Meditation. I suggest that this evening we need to survey what I have called the whole field of meditation. See if we can discover something of its topography, something of its uh, main features. What does it look like? Um, if one is going to embark upon a journey, uh, one likes to know where one is going, uh, what one ought to take with one, uh, what it's going to be like, perhaps, when you reach your destination, and uh, various other factors about the journey itself. And meditation, I think, is a journey. It is a journey inward, principally. It is a journey of discovery. And of course, as I said earlier, ultimately, each one of us has to make the journey for himself. He has to find his own mode of travel. He has to determine the conveyance he will use. And he has to decide what he will take with him. But I would like to suggest that in that regard, it is well to travel lightly. For he who tra would travel farthest travels lightly. And in this particular journey, traveling lightly means really learning about the impedimenta that one carries about oneself. That is to say, the uh, physical nature and it's uh, the kinds of obstructions that it can put up, the impedimenta of our emotional um, swingings, rhythms of, of movement from uh, great ecstasy to severe depression, the impedimenta that clutter the uh, room of the mind because we are dealing with the matter of consciousness when we're talking about meditation, quite obviously. And if our mental quarters are already crammed full of a variety of ideas, notions, prejudices, obviously it is going to be a little bit difficult to clear enough space for the mind to be still. So we will be talking about all of this, but Perhaps the big question that immediately confronts us when we are considering the field of meditation is, what makes us start? Today there is a tremendous interest in this subject of meditation. It seems to be the in thing. It has been in for some few years. Interestingly enough, the Theosophical Society, which has been in existence for nearly 99 years, which means for nearly a century, has always suggested that the techniques of meditation are useful in the realization of one's own essential nature. So it has always been an in thing, if I may put it that way, with those who have been interested in the Theosophical philosophy or who have approached the Theosophical Society to discover what the organization has to offer in the way of a philosophy. But in recent years, there seems to have been a particular interest in meditation and in yoga, which is very closely aligned, uh, very closely um, uh, aligned with meditation. And we may be able to discuss some of the technical differences. Now what makes us start, however? What arouses our interest in meditation? Why, for example, have you come to attend a series on meditation? Is it not because we become aware at some time or other in our existence, in our lives, of the fact that there must be another realm of reality than the world in which we are normally moving? We feel there must be something more 
to life, then simply the round of daily existence and pushing and pulling and moving about and so on. Plato suggested that it is we start meditation because we recall, we recollect, remember a realm from which we originally <coughs> sprang. We remember a world of reality in which we were originally rooted, from which we have moved out into the diversity of incarnation. Now perhaps this is as good an explanation as any, and perhaps it will suffice at least to initiate our discussion to suggest that something is triggered within us that recalls us to another state or condition of existence. A world of reality which we feel we are basically, inherently, essentially linked. And that if we could, in some way, move to recover that original state, we would be whole people. We would be happy people. We would be able to meet every circumstance of our existence with an equanimity, with a certain serenity, with a certain understanding that would enable us to meet whatever the situation might be. I rather like Plato's proposal that there is in each one of us the recollection of another, an inner world, a world in which we are whole in which we find ourselves truly ourselves, where we can be ourselves without all of the paraphernalia that we seem to have to present to the world, the facade that we so often present. At times it is easier, I think, to define meditation by what it is not than by what it is. And so I would like to inject here some of the things which it is not. But again, one is entering upon the subtleties of words in many respects. And while we may discuss some of these, please hold it lightly at this moment, because obviously what we're going to be sharing and the kinds of meditations we're going to be experiencing collectively during the coming six weeks, we can't say it all at once. And so perhaps as we move along, some of the distinctions, some of the differences will become clarified. But first of all, all of the writers on meditation, all of those who have written out of their own personal experience of meditating, and really meditation is ultimately defined only in the act of meditating. When one does it, as it were, one is meditating, and therefore one knows what is meditation. But all of the writers, both those who speak of the various forms of Western styles of meditation, Christian meditation, and the various philosophic schools of meditation in the West, as well as those who write of and write out of their own experience of the Eastern schools of meditation, Hindu meditation, Buddhist meditation, Chinese meditation, all of these everyone agrees that meditation as an act is not passive. It is not sort of sitting down with one's mouth open to see whatever will be attracted to come along. It is not just sort of entering into a negative state of being, a negative retreat, that it is positive 
that it is an action in which one moves in a certain determined direction. In fact, one writer uses the phrase, the first deliberate action and goes on with regard to what it involves and says, the word deliberate is worth noting here because from now on each process that we carry out must be an intended and directed act of the will. True meditation is not a negative sitting back in reverie, but, all, but it is a positive, carefully directed, and quite scientific method of working with the consciousness according to spiritual laws. This is in a very beautiful book on meditation, which we have here in the library, and I understand there are a few copies in the publishing house, in the Quest bookstore. The Silent Path, an Introduction to Meditation by Michael Eastcott. A very beautiful and a very useful book also on this subject, The Silent Path. And so he refers to it as the inner silent path. So it is not passive, it is not daydreaming, and it is not fantasizing. It is not what has been called creative brooding, although that in and of itself can be extremely useful. And anyone who has done any reflection upon a problem, who has done any reflection uh, upon a, a particular topic that in which he's pursuing uh, his studies. Uh, I know for myself when I am preparing for a talk or writing an article, uh, I engage in a great deal of what I call at least creative brooding. Uh, other people may say it looks more as though I'm daydreaming, but there's a creative brooding which takes place and this bears a certain resemblance at times, but it is not the deliberate act in, of meditation. And above all, I would like to propose that meditation is not self-hypnosis. In fact, it bears no resemblance to the hypnotic state because every faculty is brought to bear and focused as a light upon a particular subject or inwards towards a reality. And so it is essentially a creative act. It is the positive achievement of a leap in consciousness in which all areas of consciousness are harmonized, alert, and focused. It is the art of being it is the science of the self, the immortal self, not the little self, which often intrudes with its own will and its own interests and to divert our attention. Ultimately, and I'll stress this again, the path of meditation is individual, though collective meditation has its place and value, and we will experiment with some collective meditations during these sessions together. There are certain aspects of the science that may, must be grasped by every student attempting to undertake meditation. <coughs> now, basically, in the field of meditation is built, the whole science is built on the concept of graded levels of life or consciousness. And we need, therefore, to understand something of these levels. For the function of meditation, really, is to lead the conscious mind from stage to stage on an inner stairway. It is a means of progressing in consciousness. So the stairway of the self may be said to be made up of different densities of energy or consciousness. And we may speak very easily about three broad steps on this stairway of the self, three broad steps which we are accustomed to running up and down, living on, inhabiting, taking uh, uh, all, all of the events of our incarnation taking place on these three broad stairways. And this diagram may be helpful to us in understanding 
I hope you can all see it. Can you all see it? These are the three broad stairways which really together make up the personality of each one of us. And we are very much accustomed to these. Consciousness is rooted for most of us here in this personality where we have, first of all, a physical body to deal with. And we know sometimes it's difficult to deal with it. If you have ever started meditation, and I presume most of you have, if you have ever sat down and said, now I'm going to embark upon a disciplined program of daily meditation, and so you seat yourself, and I warrant you the very first day and the very first minute that you have seated yourself and you're very nice, uh, straight back and breathing nicely and so on, uh, if you use the Egyptian posture, which is the easiest for the West, which is seated in a chair, straight, and you're breathing nicely and you close your eyes, and pretty soon it's as though a fly is crawling up your leg. Or perhaps something seems to have lit on your head and you feel it. Or you're aware of a muscle twitching somewhere. Or you're suddenly, something about the physical body isn't quite right. Perhaps you're, I, I wish I'd had a drink of water before I sat down, I'm thirsty. Or suddenly you're aware of the peculiar rattle of noises and cacophony of sound that can arise from the interior organs somewhere deep within, you know. <laughs> And you listen to all of those, and the physical body is performing its own unique symphony. All of these things take place, and you think you have the physical body completely under control. You tell it where to walk, you tell it where to sit, you move it about, you get it up in the morning, sometimes with a certain reluctance, you put it to bed at night, sometimes also with a certain reluctance, but just try to bring it into complete alignment with the interior will that says, I am going to use the body as my instrument. I intend that the body shall really perform as I say it shall perform, because I can control it. I can master its various and sundry activities. Well, this is a difficulty that we encounter right at the outset. Within the physical realm, within the physical body, within the whole physical structure, we are talking about also much more than just the dense physical body which we may see or feel or be aware of. For the physical realm also moves all the way from what we might call the dense to the etheric. And the concept of an etheric aspect, an etheric counterpart of the physical body is becoming a ex very well known aspect of the entire study of the fields of energy and consciousness which surround man. This is no longer just a, a, an idea found in theosophical literature. Many scientists are postulating the existence of an etheric. And it's a very interesting study, and one can go into that. So the physical level that we're talking about moves from the densest material, solid structure to the etheric. Then the next broad stairway with which we are concerned has been called the astral in many books. It's the emotional level. And here we come to, in meditation, in the discipline of meditation, a real struggle, a battleground very often, a very real battleground. And this again is a level which has different densities, 
from what we might call the brutal emotions, the densest emotions, brutalizing in nature, to emotions of aspiration and inspiration, emotions of beauty and gentleness and purity and love. This whole gamut of the emotional nature. And again, how frequently when we initiate our uh, disciplines of meditation, embark upon this journey inward to the immortal self, to this realm of reality, we come up against all of the emotions that would push us now this way, now that, that would plunge us into depression or lift us to heights of ecstasy, which are beautiful perhaps, but again in which we are not in control. We have not used it, we have not focused the emotions. Again we are dealing with an area of our nature, a very important area, not to be suppressed, not to be set aside, but to be keyed, attuned as an instrument to be used to be used properly in the service of the whole. Well, we really cannot separate this particular stair from the one above it, because the two are very much related, and although we can look at them in a diagram quite separately, and we can say things about them that would seem to provide a distinction between these two levels, essentially they are meshed together. For the third stairway, which is well known to us, of course, is the mental level. And again, with corresponding densities, from concrete thought to the highest abstract thought. Now, our first, prog uh, our pers first uh, need in embarking upon the science of meditation is learning to use these three vehicles, these three levels, operate fully on these three stairs of our being, operate in a way in which we can say that these energies within us are directed as we would direct them, because we are not this personality. We may use it, we may adapt it, we may refine it and build it and focus it, but we are not the personality. These are steps and very useful steps on the path inward to the immortal self. And so there are steps beyond these, less easily definable in concrete language but which, to which we may either broadly assign the term spiritual or may more specifically name as the intuitional or buddhic, as you will see it in many of the books, and the spiritual or atmic, that realm of the pure self in terms of the immortal will. And so here is this vast realm into which we can move, which has been called the individuality of man, and beyond that, into that which is the essential self, the monad, the enduring pilgrim, that which truly is the universal man, as it were. This is a very useful diagram to contemplate, because this is the field of meditation. This is the path that we are determining to take. Now, before I open this to discussion, I'd like to move along with just a few more points in the survey of this field. I would like to suggest that at the very outset, if one is really determined, I'd like to at least experiment with the science of meditation. At least I would like to feel that I have taken it up. Then I think one must be very honest with oneself and examine very, very closely what is the purpose? 
What is my purpose, as it were? What is the goal in undertaking meditation? And I s suggest that there is a need for great honesty, for no one outside will ask you, but if you fool yourself, you will be the only one to know. But if you fool yourself and say it's some lofty aim, when really it is not, when it's masking perhaps some other purpose, that if I can achieve the goal of meditation, then I will have power over other people. I will be able to manipulate them by thinking about them. I will be able to attain myself great wealth or riches or some spiritual status. Or I will proclaim myself in some manner as a, a teacher, a guru. And this is, of course, very popular today, you know, particularly if you have on a turban and, and uh, an Eastern robe and so on. Uh, you can claim, you can change your name and become Swami, whatever it may be, uh, or a yogini, somebody or other, and so on, and uh, immediately gather around yourself uh, those who, who are somehow duped by the fact that you must be a very spiritual person because you have a different name or have dressed in an unaccustomed manner. But if your aim in taking up meditation is to achieve something in order to exhibit powers, if it is to achieve, in fact, the awakening of psychic powers, and often these may come along with the discipline of meditation. They are not unusual, it is not unusual. But if your aim is along those lines, then be honest about it at least. That's all I'm asking. Just at least uh, say, all right, this is what I'm going to set out to do. But be ready to pay the price of the aim that you have set for yourself. For I suggest that if the goal is, for example, a self-centered withdrawal from life, a retreat from existence, then the science of meditation will lead you only into the morass of confusion, a swampland of self-deception. And if the goal is to gain power, then be prepared to reap the whirlwind of your objective. For that is what will come. These are not warnings, they are simply statements of fact, verified through the ages by those who have experimented in one direction or another. Well, therefore, I suggest simply look at yourself. Do you want to undertake such a journey? Is it, does it seem enticing? Would you like to know who you really are? Would you like to prepare your vehicles in such a way that they can indeed be instruments of the immortal self in order that you can become a center of peace in the world, a center of calm in the midst of the storm that may be raging about us? Would it be useful in your own life to be able to live in such a manner that by your very presence, you bring peace into the atmosphere in which you are living and working, and thereby serve others. Be a help in the world instead of a hindrance, a weight upon the world. If this is the goal, if this seems a worthwhile endeavor, and of course, it is not an endeavor that is achieved in a week, or even a month, or even a year. For there are those who have been meditating daily for many, many, many years. 
and who would never think of not setting aside some period of the day, preferably in the morning hours, for a period of inner renewal, of inner relinking of the personality with the immortal self, with the great self of the universe, which is one with the self in all, without any outer show, and yet know from their own experience the inestimable value of this daily routine that is creative, that is unroutinized because it is creative every day anew in this inner manner. Well then, if you are interested in this deliberate act, then the first step of this deliberate act is to learn the art of relaxation. The art of how to relax the physical body, the emotions, the mind. And this is not easy. One of the, I suppose, almost apocryphal stories that arises in the Theosophical Society has to do with one of the, perhaps, the greatest leaders of the Theosophical movement, Dr. Annie Besant, who wrote a great number of books and some works on meditation and concentration and the spiritual life and the way of discovering this inner realm of the self. And it is said that when she first met the principal founder of the society, H.P. Blavatsky, she asked to be taught how to meditate. And H.P.B. threw a matchbox on the table and said, meditate on that. Because the art of meditation depends less upon the subject than upon the schooling, the deliberate act in bringing oneself into that alignment with the immortal self. And after some little time, HPB said to Dr. Besant, my dear, you don't meditate with your blood vessels. And so relaxation has a place. Relaxation is the first step to learn to breathe naturally easily, to relax, perhaps to relax even in the midst then of all kinds of commotion. Because what ultimately develops, and I can say this from my own experience, although I don't always remember it, that one comes ultimately to a point where one can, in the midst of great confusion and great tension, sort of step back inside oneself and breathe deeply and relax a bit. And something happens. There is an inner refreshment that can come. So the first deliberate act is relaxation. And then there are ver four very important practical aspects. First of all, place. Select a place for your meditation. If you are going to embark upon a course of meditation, the deliberate act of meditation, select a place that is the place every day. It may be some corner of your room. It may be some little area in the home that you have been able to make your own, set your own atmosphere there. It is well always, it is said, and I would agree out of my own experience, but it has been said in all the books, it is well to have a place that is a regular place and equally a time. So that if, for example, meditation is for you a, a 15 or 20 or 30 minute program each day, that it takes place at the same time each day, or approximately so. That is perhaps 7.30 in the morning, but then the next day you forget and 
along about noon you decide to do it and the next day well maybe by 10 o'clock at night you found a 20 minute period set aside. The irregularity, it is said, does not aid in the whole development of the science of meditation. So time, the proper place, a proper time. Then posture. This is an interesting point because today there is a, so much interest, particularly in the West, in the, so, uh, the postures of the East, particularly the lotus posture, which of course is that used in most of the Eastern countries, not all but many of the Eastern countries. The lotus posture, which is sitting cross-legged on either a floor or, or a cushion, and uh, in the customary lotus posture pose. For the West, it has been said, and even in some countries in the East, uh, even in China, it has been used what has been called the Egyptian posture, which is sitting in a straight chair, not in a in a lounging chair where one is perhaps likely to fall asleep, but in a straight chair with the spine erect, the both feet touching the ground, the hands palm downward uh, on the thigh, and the famous Egyptian posture. This, of course, if you look at any of the books on Egypt, you'll see what is the Egyptian posture, and that is why it is called that. But choose the posture that is best for you. But in either case, the spine should be erect and there should be an ease in the physical body so that the physical body can be, as it were, just left there while you continue your journey inwards. The physical body not neglected, but just left there, quiet, able to take care of itself, uh, able to continue upright, not falling over and falling asleep, but uh, just being there so that it is alert, so that the physical brain is not um, drugged in any way or hypnotized in some way, but simply there, and you continue your journey. The third uh, the fourth, rather, the place, time, posture, the fourth aspect is rhythm. And by this is meant both the regularity of meditation and that kind of rhythm that arises within the body itself. Learn to know yourself and what is your rhythm. For example, many people um, find it helpful in beginning the period of meditation, to breathe deeply, to breathe from the diaphragm, not uh, in short, shallow breaths as we usually do, but to breathe deeply. You may like to begin by counting how many breaths in and breathe out then. Perhaps just, it may be only five or six in, five or six out, but then set aside the number. One writer has made an interesting suggestion, I find, in this matter of the rhythm. And that is when you have discovered your own rhythm of breathing in and breathing out. Let us say that it is it's six. You breathe in, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Find a sentence that has six syllables in that sentence and repeat that, a sentence that is inspiring, a sentence that turns the attention inward and that with that sentence rather than the numbers counting of breathing in and breathing out, just to learn your own rhythm, move within your own rhythm. Some people find that 10 minutes is all they can meditate. And certainly to begin with, perhaps only five minutes before the mind is off on a million tangents, thinking about all sorts of things, and then we have to bring it back, and so on. Perhaps 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and so on. 
However, again, what is your particular rhythm? Well, I thought that before we come to the discussion then, perhaps we could just sit quietly together, take the posture of the back, the spine straight, the feet on the floor, the hands just at ease on the thighs, however it feels easiest. You may like to close the eyes or you may wish not to. And breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and out in a rhythmic manner. And as that rhythm is established, let me read a brief verse that may focus the thought. Serene light shining in the ground of my being, draw me to yourself. Draw me past the snares of the senses, out of the mazes of the mind. Free me from symbols, from words, that I may discover the signified, the word unspoken, in the darkness that veils the ground of my being, serene light. Thank you.